Hi, this is Coach MJ back on the Real Mission I'm Possible show. Today, our special guest has actually achieved the Mission I'm Possible more than you might think. Anthony Malone has lived the life of Jason Bourne. He's lived the life of Jack Ryan. He's lived the life that only novelists will dream about and get us to go and watch their movies. Today, as a patriot in the United Kingdom, having served in special forces, in paratroopers, with CIA and agency embedment, and even if, even also living as an undercover agent inside a prison, and he'll talk to you more about that, and he did that not for three days and not for three weeks, for three solid years to save lives. I'd like to bring on Anthony Malone. Thank you, sir, for coming on. Thank you very much for having me on your show as well. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we're going to get right into it. Uh, Anthony, today you have uh, stepped back from your undercover work, from your uh, anti-terrorist and counterintelligence work. You're now a civilian, I take it, and an author. You have your own podcast. You are a correspondent and an advisor to Sky News and other agencies for to help them unwrap and unravel some of the counterintelligence enigmas that are out there. Uh, what's going on today that we should know about? Well, um, like, like, it's, like I said, thank you for having us on. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the background so your viewers know a little bit about me on how I managed to get into the positions um, that I was fortunate enough to get myself in. I'm a fifth generation soldier. All my family have, have served in the British Armed Forces. And I joined the Pouch Regiment when I was 17. And I served in four power, served in three power. Was fortunate enough to be able to do two as in Northern Ireland, Kenya, Cyprus. Then I left the Pouch Regiment and I became a SWAT instructor in Africa. After that, I ended up in Cyprus, where I lived for a period of time. I, that was where I first met um, military intelligence. Uh, and then I started doing some work for military intelligence while I was in Cyprus. And I also, I also held an apartment in Lebanon. That was when I first went undercover inside Hez Hezbollah for a six-month period of time. That undercover work directly resulted in the in the stopping of the terrorist beach attack that was planned in Cyprus on off-duty American and British service personnel. I, I, um, after that, I ended up becoming an embedded combat photographer during the Iraq war with 101st Airborne. Then I ended up in Afghanistan Afghanistan. So I, I ended up uh, having quite a colourful career, met a lot of interesting people. I, I would say, I mean, certainly not a travel agency that we've uh, seen advertising the tours that you did. Um, let's let's dive back into Cyprus just for a minute. Where were you in Cyprus and how did that whole introduction happen serendipitously? I was in southern Cyprus and I'm not going to give ex exactly where I was because obviously I've still got a lot of uh, friends over there. Uh, and I ended up becoming very good friends with the head of military intelligence over there. That friendship led to a conversation that he knew I had some unusual connections uh, and I'd come across a little snippet of information. That information ended up being the little thread that we pulled and I ended up going inside Hezbollah in Lebanon around the Bekaa Valley, Beirut, for over, I was over there for over a year, but I actually was embedded with Hezbollah for a six-month period of time. Um, so that was like, that was the end of that. I've done my patriotic duty, back to Cyprus, then ended up as a, a embedded combat photographer, um, taking journalists, um, very well-known journalists, into into Iraq from the Sunday Times, I ended up picking up a lot of skills as a photographer. My hobby was photography at this time. Oh, really? I ended up it wasn't just an un undercover thing. You really did like taking pictures. 
Yeah, I really like taking photographs, and I spent a lot of time with movie cover. who worked for the uh, Sunny Times at that point, and I learned a lot of the best out there. I ended up actually going from being security to a photographer. I ended up being published in several major publications all over the world. Then, obviously, that was, like you said, it was a great cover as well. So I was approached by military intelligence again. Then I ended up uh, working alongside them from Iraq through Syria, Saudi Arabia, every Middle East country ended up in Afghanistan. Yeah, wow. I mean, that that's, that in itself is just a, a heck of a lot to take in. Uh, Anthony, can I, can I ask you, when you were going back to Lebanon, you mentioned – Hezbollah, and you were out in the Becca Valley. Now, from what we know about Lebanon and the Becca Valley, the Becca Valley is where uh, they cultivate hashish. Uh, that's part of their cash crop. Hezbollah moves out. They seem like they have a worldwide network and also a worldwide uh, terrorist network in various different countries. So uh, by going in there and embedding yourself for six months, you you can actually testify, and you have, that you were able to stop a, an attack in Cyprus and save British and American lives on a on a beach attack. That's just phenomenal. Yeah, that, 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 that was a very personal thing for me because I had a lot of friends in Cyprus who were serving in the military at that, that time. And they have children and families, both American and obviously British. So that, to me, wasn't a job. That was something that had to be d- done one of a of a better word on it obviously i've done a you know, where I've, do, I've done a lot of interviews with my colleagues in the american D- dea drug enforcement agency and I, i've obviously written reports about hezbollah being a transnational organized crime and they have their fingers in a lot of pies it isn't just the terrorist organization now it is a global criminal network that specializes in in narcotics, human trafficking as well. That's a very important thing that has to come up now because we have problems in Europe and the United Kingdom with human trafficking going into this sex trade as well. And Hezbollah are also helping to ship on the human trafficking pipelines into Central America, Brazil, up into South America. Mexico. So there's also people from Afghanistan that the Hezbollah network are helping to use or bring through the human trafficking pipeline. So with the evacuation that has happened in Afghanistan, there is a lot of, of, of Afghans, vulnerable Afghans, women, children who are being taken advantage of and they're being shipped from Afghanistan through Pakistan to Brazil. From Brazil, they are being used by the cartels over there because Hezbollah and the cartels have a very close relationship now. And there is a lot of human trafficking going into America. Statistics of some of the official databases, including Homeland Security and DEA, over 54,000 this year alone immigrants have illegally crossed over into the southern United States. I want people to have a think about that figure. We have a big problem with human trafficking in, in the United Kingdom because of what has gone on with the Ukraine war as well. Now, the figures on the Ukraine side are astonishing on how many people are being, young women and children who are being trafficked from the Ukraine into Europe, some of them are actually already appearing in Central America as well. There is over 200,000 women who are being trafficked. That includes children. So I just want people to have a little think about those figures for a minute as well. I'm, I, I'm, I'm breathless uh, to, to hear this. And and we've we've used this We've heard this word, these words, human trafficking, uh, maybe for the last 10 years. 
But but let's call it what it is. It's it's slavery, isn't it? Yes. And to 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 have an organization that you know supports the slavery of a young child, the slavery of a helpless woman into prostitution and possibly other uh, criminal activities, and you're talking about not you know five thousand, you're talking about fifty thousand in the U.S. coming to the U.S. every year as a result of that harvest. Yeah, the numbers are staggering. When I said fifty thousand, that fifty-four thousand plus is is just up to this year alone, and we're only in the second month of the year. Oh, so oh, people oh. need to have to think about that. That number is substantial. So there is a clear and present problem and a d danger from human trafficking. And terrorist organizations like the Taliban are using these pipelines to bring people into Western countries, including the United States and the United Kingdom. So that is something else that people, the public, might not be that aware of yet, but it is going to start to become very public over the next year when a lot of this starts to filter back down into mainstream press. Because at the moment, Afghanistan is a dirty word in a lot of the press, in the circles. Politicians don't want to speak about it. Because right. in my opinion, and it is just my opinion what I'm about to say, it has been the biggest cock up and clusterfuck I have seen in my entire co co career in any country, Afghanistan. We can't just sit by and watch these people be dragged out of cars and executed on the side of roads. And I'm very pleased and I'm proud to say I was one of the veterans who dusted off my boots, my day sack, got on a plane, went back to Afghanistan. And we helped, my little team helped to move over 400 vulnerable families out of Afghanistan. There was some amazing work. Where Western governments dropped the ball the veteran community doing some incredible work. Like it, over in America, a big shout out to Colonel Scott, Scott Mann, Operation Pineapple, and a lot of other groups who did very similar work. So if the veterans hadn't have done the right thing, went back out there and helped, the situation would have been a lot, a lot worse across Afghanistan. Yeah, and, and we innocently, you know, we uh, civilians, we, we watch TV reports, we watch the news. We saw uh, what what was just a shocking meltdown of the exit of the American presence. And it was as, as if there had been no plan, probably. It looks like there was no plan to get out yeah. and left all those people helpless, vulnerable, and even worse. Yeah, it was um, it was a, it was a bad situation. The veterans stepped up and helped a lot of people. The body count, let's call this what it actually is: the body count. If the veterans and have got involved across America, UK, and everyone else, all the supporters out there who supported the veteran groups as well, former members of military intelligence, former members of the CIA. Navy SEALs, Rangers, Delta, they all went out there. And they didn't get paid for this. They went out there and they'd done the right thing. And they helped a lot of people out there. I've been working on and off in Afghanistan for the past 22 years. Um, three, three years of that was when I was undercover for American intelligence inside Polish Haki, which is the maximum security prison. And now what I'm saying now is public anyway. This is the prison the, the, that the Russians built, Stephen? Yeah. It was the prison that the Russians built a long time ago, d decades ago. And it is one of the most dangerous prisons in the world. I think it is actually on the top five most dangerous prisons in the world. The reason why I decided to go in and stay in there that period of time was we discovered a lot of high-value targets, terrorists, commanders walking around under 
assumed names that America, American military and the FBI were trying to find. They already had them on petty charges, but they didn't realize who they were. They already had a lot of the people on the top 50 terrorist list in the world were inside Polish, Polish Turkey, Block 10, maximum security. Now, Talib Jan ran his entire suicide bombing network from Block 10. He was one of the most wanted terrorists in the world, is that right? That's right. And Saladin Haqqani. I've become very close to Saladin Haqqani. I taught him a lot of his English, and we used to spend days and days just talking about politics, about what what is the future for the West Afghanistan. So I actually got to actually know the mindset of these individuals over a period of time. Then, if you fast forward to the evacuation of Afghanistan 2021, I was out, I was retired, I was enjoying looking after my rose bushes in my garden. That was about as adventurous as what I was getting. But then my satellite telephone started to go off a lot one particular day, and I had Afghan generals, colonels, former intelligence assets ringing me, begging me to get them out of Afghanistan. This was three months before the official evacuation. So obviously, spoke to me family. Um, the way I worded it was I could not get involved. So instantly, I started to move people from Afghanistan, third countries, helping getting them their visas, getting them into Western countries. It was the right thing to actually do. But I wasn't going to do it on a large scale. I wasn't even going to go to Afghanistan at this point. But then the numbers expanded exponentially. Um, and it was just a case of, right, we're going to have to get feet on the ground there, mark one eyeball. And I can, I can operate a lot better if I'm on the ground. So all what I did was I still had kept in contact with a lot of my old friends across Afghanistan and the Middle East. I opened up my old intelligence network and I used that to move people through Taliban checkpoints, getting them to safety. Um, the problem was, obviously, I was there for a three-month period of time. I ended up being t taken by the Taliban and I spent 190 days in a Taliban underground interrogation center in Kabul, where I, I was with some other British nationals. Ended up being released after this time, 20th, 20th of June last year. Then I was returned to the United Kingdom after negotiations. It was interesting time. It's all about positive attitude, positive mindset. For two weeks, the Taliban didn't realize exactly who I was. After the two-week point, they actually did. So they had a bit of a sense of humor failure, is the word I would use. Because um, obviously they, they knew my real name, what who, who I used to work for, and everything. And I was honest about it. I said, "Yeah, the, the, during the war in Afghanistan, I worked against you. I managed to stop over 100 ID attacks on American British troops. I saved a lot of Afghan lives back in the day. I'm happy with that. I'm not going to de de deny that. If I go back in time, I'll do exactly the same again." This is, but the war has actually ended in Afghanistan now. That chapter has closed. You need to move from being an insurgency into a governing government who has responsibilities for its people. But unbeknown to me, there was a major power struggle, which obviously in the past 24 hours has come to fruition again between the Taliban and the Hukkanis who were jostling for power. Um, your viewers will be very interested in what I have to say now. 24 hours ago, they was fighting close to the airport between the Taliban and the Haqqanis. The reason being is the Haqqanis want to open up the schools and universities for young girls and women to go back to school. Senior members of the Taliban do not want this to happen. So that is an unusual situation. The press hasn't picked up on it yet, but they will. But the fighting has calmed down close to the airport as, as well. And that's come, come from people, Westerners, who are actually on the ground in Afghanistan right now. 
that just uncomprehensible to, to even imagine why that group of people um, uh, do not want young girls over eight years old, I think it is, to yeah. to learn to read, to to learn anything. Did you, did you ever get into it? As to where is the where does that come from? Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm not very um I'm not very politically correct. I say it as I say it. I always have. Um, and I think it's important. There's too many people out there who talk a lot and they don't do anything. Anything I say, I'll go and do it as, as well. And it's important that the Taliban get challenged on women's rights, women's education. We didn't expect the Akhanis to do it as openly and as publicly. The Akhanis are a very old network. A lot of people are going to call them a terrorist, net, a terrorist network. Yes, he is members of the Akani family on the FBI's most wanted list. regime or Saladin is the in, interior minister of Afghanistan. He is Akani. He wants women back at school. So right or wrong, what we think of him, we have to take a step back and think, you know something, we need an Afghan solution to an Afghan problem. The West cannot get involved in this. We tried it. 20 odd years we've been in Afghanistan. What did we achieve? Too much blood, ink and talk has, has been spilled. So now the West needs to take a step back again and let the Afghans deal and go govern their own country. Because the last thing I want to see is American or British or ISAF back in the day Feet boots back on the on the ground. Yeah, and here here we have it. If we look back at history, uh, it was Russia who first went into Afghanistan, and and where a cold war was fought between Russia and the United States by using Afghan insurgents to fight against them, and then the tables turned, and it's just been one quagmire after another. And you got yourself abducted twice once in a prison for three years that's not enough and then you didn't have you had didn't have enough of that you needed to go back again help out as you are a patriot there was no way to stop you and you got taken again and that's almost for a period of little, almost uh, six months 190 yeah. days yeah it was um it was emotional it was challenging it was also very educational because I got to sit with senior members of the Taliban and have very straight conversations. The way I looked at it was, if they wanted to shoot me, they were just going to take me outside and shoot me in the back of the head. There wasn't a great deal I can do about it. And I'm not the kind of person who's going to cower down in, in, in the corner. It's not me. I say it as, as I say it. They re respected that as well. Yes, I got an out time in there for the first m month or two. Yes, they done their their normal enhanced interrogation. We actually call that torture. I ended up uh, with six fractured ribs, bruised kidneys, kidney infection, nerve damage on the bottom of my feet, where they removed my shoes and socks. Five Taliban handcuffed my uh, hands and arms to the front tied my legs together, and they beat the bottom of my feet repeatedly with a thick rubber hose, so a plastic hose. So that that was that was interesting. But the reason why they did that, I refused for four weeks to give them the, the code to my telephone. And I knew after the four-week point, it would self-delay anything, anything on there that would be of interest anyway. So I thought, if I can hold out for four weeks, they're not going to get anything. So I, I actually did. I held it up. Uh, they tried everything. Pouring water over me, as always. They were hitting me with a wooden slat at the back of the head and across my shoulder blades. But my, my, my attitude was, you're not getting anything. The word no was mentioned quite a lot, and they did not appreciate that. But after the four-week point, I did gave them the code to, to my phone. And when they opened it, there wasn't anything on it. So they weren't very happy about that as well. Ah. 
I'm speechless. Anyone listening to this as a podcast versus watching our show on YouTube and other other places will just know that right now I am I'm speechless about this because here we have a guest, Anthony Stephen Malone, who has endured and, and suffered and sacrificed heroically his life for others and his welfare for others to save lives in so many situations and so many times. He he is the author of several books. In fact, three books I, I see there. Uh, we're going to talk about those. Uh, Anthony, can you can you get us stuck into the first book? Right, yeah, it was quite quite interesting because when I wrote the 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 manuscript to the tr trilogy, then I've, uh, I'm the author of five five books. The Honor Bound trilogy is is part of that. The trilogy was not meant to be a commercial book. I wrote it myself. It was raw, rough, very detailed, and they were meant as a aid me memoir for the American military and military intelligence of what works and what does not work on the cover inside the Kani network, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. So it was literally raw as that. Um, didn't even think it was going to become a commercial entity. I sent a manuscript to the colonel to see what he actually thought of it, my old friend. Uh, he was a colonel at that point. And he said, you've got the publisher. I said, well, I'm not an author. I'm not a writer. I haven't ghostwritten. This is me, my words. Um, short, direct, straight to the point. And he went, people can learn a lot. So I actually did. So that was my three years in undercover, working for American intelligence in, in Afghanistan. I then wrote a book of my time spent with the 101st Airborne Division in Iraq. And the work I did in across Iraq, Kurdistan, Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon, um, and a few other countries. My career basically has lasted 34 years, and I've been to 31 countries. So I've, I'm quite experienced when it comes to the Middle East culture, what works out there, what does not work. So it was it was good. So people have got the books, they read them. And a lot of guys that I actually know who were still serving. I would just like to make a little point there. I, I was never I never served in special forces. I was just a member of the parachute regiment of the of the British military, but I have worked alongside special op operations all, all over the world. Right. So, so I just want to make a little point there. Yes, Not sir. Not at all. I have a lot of respect for these guys. They are my very close friends anyway. I, a lot of people thought or still think that I, I that I was officially special operations. The answer is absolutely not. I've never claimed to be that. But I have said that I was an agent sent from intelligence agency for a lot of years. I worked for a, a military intelligence, different countries, and I lead pays with and work with agencies like the FBI and the Drug Enforcement Agency all over the world as well. We're talking to Anthony Stephen Malone. He has worked... Uh, with all the intelligence agencies in the Middle East, he's traveled to 31 countries. He's he's had an exceptional career of three decades, and there is a story I found out about which is absolutely astonishing. It is when someone in British intelligence sent one of your closest friends, or tried to coax one of your closest friends to take you out because they thought you had turned. Yep, that was um, wasn't very happy about that. Of your of your answer, yeah, but because of the work we were doing with with the American intelligence, the Brits were on a need to know basis at this point, because some of the people within the British Embassy were not in Kabul back in the day, were not doing their their job properly, and we knew some of their interpreters were on the payroll of organisations like the Taliban. Akani and Al Qaeda. Um, I have, I still have all the evidence to support that. Wow. So the Brits were not informed about anything I was doing. So as far as they were concerned, at this point, I had turned. I was a 
military veteran, highly trained, who had now turned and became a terrorist commander. So they thought they had a major problem. They didn't realize for over three years that I was actually working for American intelligence and we had been feeding information back long before I was in Afghanistan. So I had a proven track record of everything that I had done. How did that make you feel to know that your own people, your own countrymen had already now with all you sacrificed, with all you've given up, with all of the initiatives that you were the first to point out, there's a danger here, there's a danger here. You were the man, you were the one who was our United States. We have Paul Revere that was calling it, hey, let's get going on. We have a problem here. And yet now you suddenly are the bad guy. Well, the way I look at it is I take a positive out of a negative. I knew I had official top cover of the American government. And I knew at some point in the future that if I wasn't killed inside the prison by, by Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, then the Brits would most, most probably try to rendition me back to England and ch charge me for being a terrorist, co terrorist commander. So top cover was already put in play anyway. So if that issue ever came up, I knew within 24 hours the American government would contact the British government and say, right, Anthony's actually ours. You cannot ch charge him under the Terrorism Act or anything connected to, to that, which evidently they did try to do. Members of the British Foreign Office even tried to get a court in England to officially charge me for using a mobile telephone while in prison in Afghanistan because it was a British mentor jail. So they actually tried charge me for using the, the, the very phone I got from American intelligence to pass information back on attacks on British soldiers in Helmand who were from my old regiment, Hausha Regiment. The American Regiment, 101st Airborne Division in Afghanistan, was also there. So I had a lot of friends in Afghanistan at this point who were being hit by the Taliban. So I did the only thing that an airborne, an airborne soldier would do, rolled up my sleeves, infiltrated it, got as much information as we could, and we fed it back. The British government had a meltdown when they found out who I was, what I was doing. The British ambassador at this time, this was 2008, to the, 2007, 2008, even tried telling people in a meeting that I had never served in the British Army. He had one fundamental problem with that. His close protection team, who were in the room when he said this, in all four corners, were all former members of the Parachute Regiment, who I had served with in Northern Ireland. One of them I had actually passed training with in Depot Power. So he pointed out to the ambassador, I don't know where you're getting this from, but you're talking crap. Anth is Power Edge. He's also a patriot. He's also worked a lot of different jobs helping to keep our country safe. So the ambassador wasn't very happy about this. So he got all the parachute regiment guys from his detail transferred out of Afghanistan. What? Yep. Yeah, that, is, that is, is fact. Incredible. We're talking to... Anthony Stephen Malone, the author of Honor Bound. He's a five-time author, a veteran in the uh, British force, not British forces, in the paratroopers. And he has served and consulted with every intelligence agency in the Western world. Today, after giving us an account of his days in prison, Anthony, I'd like to ask you, you were in this prison for three years. It yeah. only takes one day to slip up. Maybe you talk in your sleep. There's 5,000 other threats inside that prison and only one of you. What was your scariest day? Did something happen that you kind of went, whoops? Yeah, they, there was a lot of, um, there, there was actually a lot of uh, very hairy moments. Um, the other thing, I do not talk in my sleep. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, I would never do that. 
Yeah, it was it was interesting. We, I only expected to be in there a three m- month period of time, but because of what we discovered was a fully operational terrorist cell command and control structure from inside a maximum security jail. They had telephones walking around freely using phones, sat phones. They had a laptop in their radios. So it's the safest place to be because no one's going to look there. They safest place many, for them to be, right? That's their head office. Room. Yeah. They were using it like an office and no one would even suspect what was going on. The Taliban and uh, obviously Akani al Qaeda, they ran the inside of Polish Turkey at that time. End of. The guards had, had the wall. Nearly all the guards I knew in there all had family members in the Taliban or within the Akani network anyway. So the guards done what they were told. But it was interesting because after the three month point, when I was meant to get, get out of there, my team out, outside, and I had to be very careful in what I was telling people because this was a very dangerous situation I was in. A team of former special forces and members of the parachute regiment who were off duty had volunteered to break me out of prison. There was a big team. They had helicopters. We had we had everything. It was it was all ready to go. They, what they said was, you would have done it for us no matter what. You would have came after us and got us out. So my team is very loyal, even to this day. They're very, they're very, very loyal. I stood the, the team down and said, thank you very much for putting this into play. And they had planned it. It was there. It was, I was told, be in the courtyard this day at this time, you were going to get out. Um, I stood the team down said, lads, really, really appreciate this. Please tell all, all the team members, deeply appreciate it. I'm going to stay. I have to stay. Now, they said, Anthers have uh, mentally, he's lost the plot or he's working. And my team's known me for a long time. And they went, we're going to edge our bets here. You're working. What you're working on? I said, I can't tell you what I'm working on. But I can tell you it's important. And every day in here is a life that we have saved. So I started to filter information as well back to my team. One of those bits of information was 12 suicide bombers en route from the Middle East to the United Kingdom. So I'd like to give a massive shout out to Colonel Bob Stewart, Member of Parliament. I got that information to my team. My team got back to England. Went to speak to Colonel Bob Stewart. Colonel Bob Stewart walked my team into MI6 headquarters and those attacks were prevented. So that's one instance of one of the things that were actually done. Amazing. Amazing. 12 attacks, that could have been hundreds of lives. That's just amazing. Yeah. Well, well, what we're going to look at, it it isn't a secret now, it's out there. They they were looking at hitting the, the normal targets like Buckingham Palace. 10 Downing Street, Houses of Parliament, trains. They were going to try and use suicide attack on Liverpool Football Club. I support Liverpool Football Club. I took that very personal. And they were going to try and hit, I won't say where, but they were going to hit the schools of children, of serving British soldiers. Well, you don't have to, I don't have to say a great deal about that. That pissed me off. So I made sure the report was very detailed. It had photographs of these guys, where they were, and the ones that were in England, we had them, pictures of them, stood next to British registered vehicles. So basically what we gave wasn't just a report, it was a detailed target package on each each of these individuals. Whoa. Whoa, that's, that's... Again, an incredible thing to take on. And I'm sure our viewers and listeners out there are just fascinated. Of course, there's more detail in the books, in the trilogy that you've written, Honor Bound. Um, what, what's next for you? Uh, Anthony Stephen Malone is with us here. What's next for you, Anthony? What I'm doing at the moment is I'm heavily involved in counter-human tra- trafficking. 
I think it's an important subject, both into the United States, across Europe, and into the United Kingdom. And I think it's very important that people get to know not the hub-hub or the stories about human trafficking, the facts, what is happening, where, who's involved. These are organised cartels. So I'm involved in helping to write reports on this. And I think it's a very worthwhile thing to, to actually do. And if we can save one life in doing this, I think that is important. I, I also run a little organisation, private organisation, called Patriot. And we help homeless military veterans and veterans with PTSD, their families and their children as well. Very important in the United Kingdom and in America as well. So... I don't have a great deal of spare time. I have a family. I have I have two two young girls. So in between everything else, they keep me grounded. And yeah, so I'm just trying to do what I do. I'm using my experience, my contacts, and trying to serve the best I can. Well, sir, it's been an honor to have you here today. And I'm sure that our audience would like to know more about you. We'll be putting up the links and to your books as well. And we wish you all the best for taking on this new crusade of helping to thwart human trafficking wherever it happens. And it's happening in places we had no idea about, thanks to your uh, insights today. And thank you, Anthony Stephen Malone, for your service. And thank you for being a living hero and making the mission I'm possible a reality. Is anything that is impossible if you plan and prep properly? Everything can be done and achieved. It's all about this. It's about your mindset. I'd like to say a little bit message to people out there. If you're going through a hard time at, at the moment, we all do. I've been through hard times. In the present economic climate, it's very difficult for people, difficult for families, okay? Stay focused. If you're having a really bad day, reach out to people who you know. If you're a military veteran, reach out to other veterans. We've all been there. We've had dark days, okay? Speak to someone about it, and you'll find the sun will shine in the morning. If you're feeling down one particular day, get your boots on, get your trainers on, get out in the countryside. It's about your mindset, and you'll feel a lot better for doing that as well. I'd just like to say thank you for having me on your show, and thank you for everybody who has seen this particular interview as well. Stay, stay safe out there. You're a hero, sir. Thank you very much. It's been an honor.